Oh, hi. I um, just wanted to bring in a lecture tank of, uh, of a gas. This happens to be krypton, the inert gas krypton. And lecture tanks are under high pressure. There's quite a bit of krypton gas inside there. And uh, if I go ahead and open the valve, krypton would leave and it wouldn't bother anybody. Krypton is inert. Krypton is rather heavy compared to, say, oh, argon, neon, or helium, which sit up higher in the periodic table and have less mass. If this heavy gas escapes, it's going to go out slow. I just did something terrible. I showed it going real slow when actually, boom, it's probably going at a couple of hundred miles per hour. O2 inside this room at 298 Kelvin and one atmosphere is going at about 1,081 miles per hour. So over 1,000 miles per hour is a O2 gas. So this is probably going slower, like 600 miles per hour. Um, the faster gases are your lighter gases, and we can use this as an experiment to identify unknown gases. Let me set this to the side and talk about a little equation and a little apparatus, what we could do. What we could do is we can go ahead and take a gas and go ahead and just think of it as being a tube coming out here. Let the gas go through a tube and hit a detector. And the detector's set up to go ahead and say, no, nah, I'm not detecting any gas. Oh, the gas just went ahead and hit me. And what you can do is either monitor it by a color change, or the detector could be hooked up to an electronic alarm where it'll go, beep, a gas has gone ahead and uh, de been detected. So um, what we can do is open up a gas here, beep, and then detect it and say, here's how much time it takes for it to travel. And uh, based on a standard, go ahead and calculate its molar mass, possibly identifying the gas. Now, gases would go very quickly through this tube, too fast for us to like get ready with a stopwatch. So what we sometimes do is we go ahead and it's called pack. I put some dots inside this tube. We'll pack a column. We'll put something inside the column like baking powder, and it's going to slow the gas down so that the gas fuses across there much slower. So you could go ahead and say, I'm opening it, and a uh, lab partner of yours could go ahead and hit a stopwatch and uh, set this up so that it takes maybe half a minute to a minute and a half. The detector goes bing, and then you hit the stopwatch, and you've got some data. Now what you want to do is you want to do this with a known gas to begin with. And uh, I chose chlorine. It doesn't have to be chlorine. But I went ahead and chose chlorine. And my column allows chlorine to effuse. And it takes a little bit less than a minute, 0 0.855 minutes, according to the stopwatch. Then what you do is get all set with your new gas. Let's say I didn't tell students what this gas was. We go ahead and hook this up, open it, do the timing, and uh, get our data. Well, I made up a problem. And uh, I'm going to say that the unknown gas takes a little bit over a minute, 1.16 minutes, as a matter of fact. So what we can do is set up a ratio going, well, if it takes so long for chlorine and so long for the unknown, what about the ratio of their molar masses? Well, it is a square root function. Time is going to be proportional to the square root of the molar mass. The reason for that is our average velocity, which is mu RMS, the velocity of the gas, and root mean square is just the statistical function that we use to calculate this because the speed of the gas isn't a bell curve. It's got a tail out at the fast end. It's equal to the square root of 3RT over, and I'm going to abbreviate molar mass as mm. So if you will, the speed is proportional to the square root of the inverse of the molar mass. Now, the molar mass, the heavier, OK, the slower. What that really means is the heavier, the slower, the more time it takes for it to go ahead and go across. So I set up a little ratio equation where the time it takes for one gas divided by the time it takes for the second is equal to the square root of the molar mass of the first gas divided by the square root of the molar mass of the second gas. Let me set this up with our data. I'm going to let chlorine be gas number one. So the time it takes for chlorine is 0 0.855 minutes. Gas number two is our unknown. And the only data we have for our unknown is, is that it takes 1.16 minutes for the unknown gas to effuse through the tube. That's going to be equal to the square root of the molar mass of chlorine. Now, chlorine is 35 and a half or so, but there are two chlorines. It's Cl2. So let me write down that it's 70.9 grams per mole. And we don't know what the molar mass of our unknown gas is. I'm going to abbreviate that as mm 
of the unknown. Many students like to go ahead and say, well, it's an unknown. I'm going to let it be x. Other students will keep it as molar mass of gas 2. So they'll write molar mass of 2. I'm just putting in that when we get this, it's going to be the molar mass of our unknown. Let me show all my work here. It's the first time I've done this. I'm going to cross multiply, divide, and then square this. So I'm cross multiplying my known values, 1.16 minutes times the root of 70.9. That's going to be equal to 0 0.855 minutes times the root of the molar mass of the unknown. So I've got this going on that diagonal. Oh, there we go. That just barely fit in there. Um, divide both sides by 0 0.855 minutes. On the left side, the units of minutes cancel. So I'm going to put x's through the minutes here. Now on your calculators, and I'll do this in just a moment, we're going to go 1.16 times the root of 70.9 divided by 1, I'm sorry, 0 0.855. And the units are actually going to be square root of grams divided by square root of moles because of that root sign. And I don't know what the physical significance of that is, but we're in between steps, and it's going to work out OK. Trust me. On the right side, by design, those 0 0.855 minutes cancel, and we end up with the root of the molar mass of the unknown. So on the left side of this equation, my calculation is going to be 1.16 times the square root of 70.9 divided by 0.855. And I come up with this being 11.4 square root of grams over square root of moles, which is nonsense, but that's going to go away. And on the right side, we have the square root of our molar mass of the unknown. Ah, that's fine. Now, to get at the molar mass, we need to get rid of the root sign, so square both sides. So I'm going to go 11.4 squared. And I end up with 130 grams per mole. See, the grams and the moles worked out fine because we squared the number and we squared the units. So we get grams per mole. Let's take a look at a periodic table of the elements and see if there's a gas that we know of that has a molar mass of about 130. Then we can say, hey, this might be it. Oh, look at that. Xenon has the molar mass, or the atomic mass, because it's just an atom. It's a noble gas of 131. Maybe it's xenon.